Welcome to your Essential Business Briefing. I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up, another blow to France's beleaguered tourism industry as the coronavirus outbreak hits international travel from the key market of China. Ireland's hopes for a post-Brexit boost to tourism. We'll hear from the head of the government agency promoting the island as a holiday destination. And only 800 residents but 15 bookshops, the French village that lives on literature. First up, though, there are many sectors of the global economy suffering because of coronavirus and the quarantine measures put in place as a result. The travel industry is among those hardest hit, with international airlines suspending flights in and out of China. France is a major destination for Chinese tourists. More than two million of them visited in 2018. The loss of their business could prove catastrophic for some firms, as Luke Schrego now reports. A few people inside at Chantilly Chateau, about 50 kilometres north of Paris. Another result of the COVID-19 epidemic and the loss of one of its main sources of tourists. Since the SARS epidemic about 15 years ago, there's a complication we haven't seen before, that all the airlines have blocked flights. The estate's not the only business to be losing revenue. French firms designed to cater directly to the Chinese market are even worse off. That's three vehicles that we have that aren't in use at the moment. It's not just that either. This travel firm is wondering what to do with its own personnel. When it comes to transport, it's dropped by 50%. We've had to ask several employees to take their vacation days. We just don't have the work at the moment, so it's best to head off on holiday. By all estimations, the coronavirus outbreak could last for some time. France is looking at a 70% drop in the numbers of Chinese visitors up until the end of May and a corresponding loss of 2 billion euros. And that's just the beginning after a particularly poor 2019. Things have barely gotten going again with tourists still staying away. We're going to need at least six months for levels to get back to normal. Brexit uncertainty, transport strikes and street protests all kept tourists away last year, with hotels now sent scrambling again. For the weekend ahead, we've got 66 cancellations. In March, it's 264. And in April, 100% of Chinese guests have cancelled. To try and minimize the losses, we're working with other tour operators representing other countries. That may be easier said than done. Fears had its own knock-on effect. And with other Asians afraid to visit the same places as Chinese tourists, France is looking at a 40% drop in arrivals from that region until May alone. Well, let's stay with the business of tourism. I'm joined in studio now by Niall Gibbons, who's the CEO of Tourism Ireland, the government agency that promotes uh, the island of Ireland as a destination. Thank you very much for coming in to speak to us. Coronavirus, obviously a big issue for the French tourism industry. How is the Irish industry being affected? Well, it's early days to quantify it, but certainly in the first wave of coronavirus that hit in China, it's a market that uh, Ireland doesn't depend on to a significant extent, about 0.9% of our business. But still, I mean, it's a very important humanitarian issue. You know, we expressed our solidarity with the people in China. We have a team out there as well. Very, very difficult circumstances. And certainly the direct air access that we established into Ireland over the last number of years is certainly in jeopardy. Uh, however, I mean, most of our markets come from you know, our top four markets, the United States, Britain, Germany and France. So I think what's happened this week is much more significant for us in terms of Italy and the potential contagion throughout Europe as well. And we're taking it very seriously and we're evaluating it on a daily basis. Have you seen many cancellations with the Ireland at Italy rugby game has been cancelled? That's surely going to impact a lot of business and in Dublin. We're certainly very sorry to see the, the, the big sporting events being cancelled, but obviously we are getting anecdotal feedback from the main carriers of cancellations. Difficult to quantify the extent of it. I think what we're seeing now is that, you know, a lot of media coverage around this, a lot of concern amongst consumers as to what will travel mean for me. School groups are a very important part of our business from Italy at this particular time of the year. Uh, and obviously um, the Italian government has put a ban on those travelling now between now and the middle of March. So that's certainly having an impact on our business as well. But I think this is a very important time of the year. We're right in the peak of the booking cycle right now. Now. It's causing a level of uncertainty in the industry. It's important for our industry to remain calm. It's important that we remain positioned well for the bounce back that will come when this passes, by the way. I had the same experience with SARS many years ago when that industry, or the industry bounced back by 600% uh, in the aftermath of SARS. 
OK, so that'll be one of the challenges facing the industry. Another big issue that's, that's faced Ireland, and I imagine tourism as well, has been Brexit, uh, that, you know, we at least have some certainty on what's happening there now. Is that an opportunity for Ireland to attract more visitors? Well, it'll be quite interesting in 2020. We know now that the withdrawal agreement has been passed in January. and We've got relative certainty now for the year ahead. I mean, I have to say that, you know, travelling to Ireland from a tourism perspective uh, doesn't change arising from Brexit. Whether you travel north, south, east, west, uh, you know, you still can get around uh, the value uh, that's there is terrific and the welcome is better than ever. So we're glad now that we get into a position of stability for 2020. The currency exchange rate between sterling and the euro has moved in Ireland's favour. So that was a better. big issue because, you know, weaker sterling is, uh, it means that people might find that a more attractive place to go on holidays. So Correct. Well, back in 2016, we saw a depreciation of 20%, which made Ireland more expensive and the number of UK visitors fell by 7%. But we have seen now the number of UK visitors stabilised. It actually increased by 1% last year. And I think 2020 could be a good year for tourism from Britain to Ireland. Is there a chance that perhaps people travelling from continental Europe might choose Ireland over the UK as a destination if things become that little bit more complicated when we move past the withdrawal agreement stage? Well, it's interesting. We've done a, a few uh, rounds of research in Germany and France, and Brexit is certainly on the minds of the consumers in Europe. I think people are looking for a hassle-free holiday. They, they aren't thinking of Brexit when they're, when they're going to go to their eventual destination. They want to know they can get there easily. They're not going to have any hassle. They're going to get a great welcome. And they get to all those things in Ireland, really. So I think Ireland will, will be in a, a good vantage point when we come into both this season for 2020, notwithstanding coronavirus, and certainly into 2021 as well in the long term. Now, you've set a pretty ambitious goal for increasing your visitors uh, 7% by 2022. Where do you see those new visitors to Ireland coming from? I think the best prospects for growth right now lie in uh, North America and also mainland Europe. Now, obviously, things are unfolding during the course of this week that may impact in relation to the realisation of those targets. Certainly, North America still remains a very strong market for Ireland in 2020. 10% of all North American business to mainland Europe is stopping in Ireland. We've got great connectivity. Uh, it's all aided by the diaspora links, by the foreign direct investment links. But Ireland brand, Ireland's brand in North America is exceptionally strong. Um, we found mainland Europe to be the star performer of Irish tourism over the last decade. The mainland Europeans spend more and stay longer than many other visitors. So markets like Germany and France, which are our third and fourth largest markets respectively, uh, still show great promise for us. And we feel confident we can see further growth between now and 2025 from those markets. And from a marketing point of view, when you're picking the areas of the world to target and, and sell Ireland to, how much research do you do beforehand about things like how much visitors will spend if they come to the country? Well, tourism is a very well-established industry in Ireland. We operate in 23 markets around the world. We divide them into three different tiers. So our top tier markets of North America, uh, Britain, France and Germany deliver over 70% of our visitors. There's a second tier then of markets like Canada, Australia, Italy, Spain. And then we get to a third tier, which are the newer and developing markets like India and China, which you know, will deliver more in the medium to long term than in the short term because it requires a bit of structural change within our industry. But we still see over the next you know, five to 10 years that those top four markets will still produce the lion's share of our business. Um we're heading into St. Patrick's Day in the month of March. It's a big marketing push. Irish ministers go all over the world, you know, which is a good flag-waving exercise for Ireland as well. Is that an important boost for tourism and, a, and an exercise for you as an organisation? It's an amazing opportunity, I have to say. There's no other country that has a platform like this uh, that is so small that offers such opportunity uh, for, for a country like ours. So we're delighted to work you know, alongside our colleagues in government to push the Irish message abroad. We get a great welcome no matter where we go. Uh, I mean, about over 40 countries around the world will have civic, civic receptions parades. Uh, and it's a great time of the year for tourism because it's also a time when people are thinking about booking their holiday. And for Ireland to be trending number one on social media for all the right reasons gives us a great platform then to convert that into business. And part of the element of that is what's called the global greening where you light up landmarks in green. Uh, any big new landmarks being added for this year? Well it was a very simple idea that started 10 years ago when we lit the Sydney Opera House green in 2010 and last year we had 475 global icons lit green around the world. So everywhere from the Empire State Building Building, the London Eye, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, the Burj Al Arab. Uh, here in France, we're delighted that the Moulin Rouge will become the Moulin Vert on St. Patrick's <laughs> Day. But France actually leads the charge. We have 50 iconic buildings around France lighting up green for St. Patrick's Day. And we'll have more uh, in time to come. We expect to have over 500 this year. But it's a great PR opportunity as well. It's a bit of fun. And it's great to have people prepared to light their civic attractions up in our national colour. It's a great uh, sense of pride in Ireland for that. OK, Niall Gibbons from Tourism Ireland, thank you very much for joining us. Next to the story of a French village where the main business is books. Montaulieu in southwest France has a population of just 800 but boasts 15 second-hand bookshops. 
at a time when independent booksellers are struggling in the face of online competition. The village is one of eight in France trying to attract visitors with a love of literature. Erin Ogunki reports. In the heart of the French countryside, these small winding streets harbour hidden treasures for book lovers of all kinds. We're looking for comics for our five-year-old grandchildren. So there's something for five-year-olds to 75 and even 80-year-olds. Some come open to whatever they may find, while others know exactly what they're looking for. The owner scours her 15,000 publications to no avail. But all is not lost. You may have a chance with my associate over there. The specialized shops form a close network here, where books are a shared passion. Fifteen bookshops for just 800 inhabitants. Montolieu is one of France's eight book villages, where small-scale shops are now a tourist attraction. The small town owes its entire economic life. Its grocery store, doctors, pharmacies, a tobacco shop and five restaurants, to books. Adding to the charm and affordability, the stores offer used books. I prefer used books to new ones because they have a past life, which new ones don't have. Old ones have been touched, read and contemplated by others. It's extraordinary. In the neighboring village's mill, the same family has made paper out of old textiles for 200 years. Shredded and then soaked, the mill produces pulp, the base ingredient for paper. This is what holidays are for. It's a fun, interactive activity. The workshops are a magical experience for both adults and kids. They discover the magic of paper. It's fabulous. White sheets line the walls of the mill, forming the starting point for new stories to come. That's it from us for this week. You can listen back to this and previous shows as a podcast and you'll find us on social media too, on Facebook at France 24 Business and you can tweet me at New Stephen. Until next time, thanks for watching. With Super Tuesday approaching, the day when more delegates meet one than any other single day in the U.S. primary season, we've come to Texas, a key battleground state, to find out which Democrat is going to be leading the charge against President Donald Trump in November. Inside the Americas, hosted by Tom Burgess Watson on France 24 and France24.com.